Hi, this is Professor Fernandez, and this is video two in lesson 16. We're talking here about the second derivative test, and I'm going to do that within the context of example 4.27 from Calculus Simplified. I've actually added a part C to this example that isn't in the example in the book. The reason is that I want to use the same function that we were working on in the previous video. This is video 16.1, where we were looking at the concavity and the inflection point. So Check that video out to get more uh, information on the review of concavity and inflection points. So in this video, I want to use some related concepts, namely the second derivative test, um, to show that this function has a local maximum at x equals negative 1 and a local minimum at x equals 1. Um, you may remember that local extrema we can also find using the first derivative test and the notions of critical points and critical numbers. Um, I don't have the video reference for you, but certainly maybe less than 13 or 14 that we covered that in this course. So in this case, I'm going to though show you how to do this using the second derivative test. So I've put that down here. I'm just going to zoom in here and review that. So this test says, suppose the second derivative of a function is continuous on an interval including a special uh, x value c for which the first derivative is 0. So in other words, we are looking, we are starting with the presumption that at x equals c, the function is locally flat, right? So it doesn't look like this, right? Because if this is x equals c, the derivative here does not exist, right? Is this the tangent line or is that the tangent line? So um, in more specificity, we're looking at a function that looks at x equals c locally flat. So it could be locally flat and concave down, it could be locally flat and concave up, or it could be locally flat and having some sort of a inflection point uh, going on here. Um, so maybe, maybe doing this, right? But if you zoom in, the idea is that this hypothesis tells us that the function looks locally flat there. Um, and then we want the second derivative to be continuous also for the purposes of this theorem. Then what does the theorem say? Well, if the second derivative is positive at C, then we have a local minimum there. If it's negative at C, we have a local maximum. So this should kind of make sense if you just draw some pictures. So I'm going to draw them for you here. Um, here's x equals C, right? And we already know we have a locally flat function. So if the second derivative is positive at C, then you can basically think of this as being concave up near C. And you can see already that that would make x equals c a local minimum, right? The smallest y value relative to all these other y values above it. So concave up, local minimum. And if I go ahead and draw the same picture, but again, assuming locally flat, I get f double prime negative at c, right? That's kind of going to tell me that I have a concave down behavior of the function. So x equals c the y value would be the largest of all the y values up here. So we would expect a local maximum. So that's the conclusion down here. All right, so that's sort of the intuition behind the second derivative test. So now let's use that in this example. So let's look at this function, x cubed minus 3x. We need the second derivative. So let's go ahead and do that. Um, this is a difference of power functions. So I'll just apply the power rule twice here and get the second derivative to be 6x. Um, once again, I, I, I have to check a few things for the theorem. So that's why I wanted to go over it first, right? Um, so I have a couple of conditions. Is the second derivative continuous on the interval containing the x value at which the first derivative is 0? That's a mouthful. OK, but if I go here and I set the first derivative equal to 0, I am solving. 3x squared minus 3 equals 0. So variety of ways to solve this. I'll do the quickest way. x squared equals 1. So I get x equals plus or minus 1. Those are the two points, right, that they asked me to um, investigate in the part C. OK, so I know that at those two points, plus and minus 1, the first derivative is 0. I also know that the second derivative is equal to 6x. That is a continuous function at all x values, including the two points that I just found. So I have just verified the only two hypotheses of this theorem. So I get to now use the two conclusions. So I'm now going to look at the sign, S-I-G-N, of the second derivative at these two c values, x equals plus and minus 1. So let's do that over here. So f double prime uh, 
evaluated at negative 1 would be negative 6, right? So I'm using f over prime is 6x. That's negative. So this implies that x equals negative 1 is a over here, right? Down here I got negative for the second derivative, so I have a local maximum. It is a local max. Great. And then doing the second um, c value here, which was x equals 1 over here from over here, uh, I use my 6x here and I substitute 1, I get 6. That's positive. So that tells me that x equals 1 is a local minimum. Okay, and that's actually what we wanted to show. So show that f has a local maximum at negative 1. There it is. And show that it has a local minimum at 1. There it is. All right, so I'm going to close with just um, some more intuition, you know, not for the second derivative test, but what we just showed here. Um, one of the nice things about the second derivative test is that you get to just plug in the x values, right? So we just did that. We got 6 for x equals 1, right? Uh, and that was positive, so that implied a local um, max. Sorry, a local um, minimum, right? So positive over here, local minimum. So implies local minimum. Okay, so this is really nice in the sense that if you are looking for local extrema, then what we had done before here was to use the first derivative test. And if you remember what we have to do for the first derivative test, right, we have to find the first derivative and then we have to find the critical numbers. Um, and there's a, a bunch of other um, steps that we have to take. So we have to set up our sign charts and we have to see if um, we're able to actually uh, get the uh, first derivative values in between you know, here and here and look at how things change. It's quite a process. What's nice about the second derivative is that as we just saw in this example, right, I just find the particular c values at which the derivative is zero. So that is a restriction. Um, I'll tell you about that in a minute. But then I get to just substitute them into the second derivative. And depending on the sign SRGN, I have an immediate conclusion, local maximum or local minimum. Um, so that's nice, right? I don't have to go through all that other stuff that I did before with the first derivative test. Okay, so let me go back to that restriction that I mentioned. Um, so what is really going on here with this assumption? So you might remember when I find the local maximum and local minima for uh, using the first derivative test, um, I set the first derivative equal to zero and also investigate where it does not exist. So that is one of the ways in which this second derivative test is a bit more restrictive. The assumption in this theorem is that uh, x, at x equals c, the first derivative is zero. If at x equals c, the first derivative does not exist, I cannot use this theorem. So that's another important reason to pay attention to the hypotheses in theorems. Because, for example, if the function looked like this, okay, I've tried to draw a little peak here, then the first derivative could help you figure out that, you know, potentially somewhere over here, sorry, the second derivative test could help you figure out that potentially over here there's a local maximum. And maybe kind of over here there's a local minimum. But it would not be able to uh, um, figure this one out. Because at that c value over here, the first derivative does not exist. And so you, you are not satisfying this hypothesis of the theorem. You can't use this theorem. In other words, you can't use the second derivative test. So um, despite the fact that the second derivative test makes it a lot easier, you don't have to deal with sign charts. You can just substitute in um, x values uh, to determine local max, local min. It doesn't work for all situations, right? So you don't want to, um, you know, uh, uh, stick to one test or the other. You want to be able to use both the second derivative test and the first derivative test um, and be proficient with each of them to make sure you can use them together uh, and just use the one that makes life most uh, easy. For polynomials, the second derivative test is the one I would recommend because um, there will never be a situation where the derivative does not exist for a polynomial. And because you can just substitute in points into the second derivative test and look at the sign and conclude from there, local max, local min, 
that's going to be the fastest way to do it. But for functions that are more complicated and you might have points where the derivative doesn't exist, right? you might then want to augment your second derivative test with a first derivative test.